Okay, so everybody, hello and good morning and good evening We're from uh, wherever you are from. Uh, we are very, very honored and pleased to have Professor Kyungyeon Cho. And this first slide is what he gave us as his bio, and it's on his homepage as well. Let me just read very quickly through it. Kyungyeon Cho is an associate professor of computer science and data science at NYU and CIFAR. Fellow of Learning in Machines and Brains. He's also a Senior Director of Frontier Research at the Prescient Design Team within Genetic Research and Early Development. He was a research scientist at Facebook AI Research from June 2017 to May 2020, and a postdoc fellow at uh, Montreal until summer of 2015 under supervision of Joshua Bengio, after receiving PhD and MSc degrees from Aalto University um, in Finland under the supervision of Professor Juha Karhunen, Dr. Tapani Raiko, and Dr. Alexander Ili. I should also say he's a graduate of KAIST uh, Computer Science too, for his bachelor's degree. Uh, he tries his best to find a balance among machine learning, natural language processing, and life, but almost always fails to do so. So I have to say, including Kyungyeon and all the other speakers give very sort of humble introduction and in a bio to us. So I sort of tried to augment it a little bit. Uh, so this is from his Facebook post. And I apologize to those of you who don't read Korean, but it says uh, in Korean news that he received the Turing Award, uh, which is actually not true. This is fake news, but he did re receive a lot of other awards, including the very prestigious Hoam Prize and Alto University alumni, Samsung AI researcher, Google faculty, numerous Google faculty awards, and you know many, many papers awards. And I'm sure he'll receive many more awards to come. But what's really uh, extraordinary about Kyungyeon is that he does a lot of things uh, for improving the society and humanity and all these things that we always think that we should do but never do. But he actually puts it into action. He has pro bono hours twice a week. That's very, very valuable time that he spends. And also, you know, he gave away his prize money <laughs> to many different um, causes, including KAIST. So we're, we're very pleased to have him as one of our donors to, uh, to, the, to our university. So thank you for that. And this is what people had to say. And I, I have to sum up by saying, you know, like what Ed had said, for thank you for continuing to redefine the standard of morality that we should em embrace within our community. So I'll end with that and let uh, Kyungyeon take away with his talk. Well, thanks for the uh, super generous introduction and also the invitation. I, I do remember, you know, attending one of these CS colloquiums when I was a student at computer science, I was undergrad there. And then who knew that I was going to actually give a talk here uh, as a speaker. So thanks for giving me this opportunity. And uh, well, I'll just get to it right away because there's nothing more to add about me. I think the Alice gave, gave the, let's say, the best introduction I could have ever have received so far. So today I thought I'm going to talk a bit about how what, what is the right way to think about or the, what is a what a way to think about what machine learning is and how this let's say different way to think about machine learning allows us to think of what is the right way to analyze data because at the end of the day that data is really at the heart or the core of machine learning and the recent advances in more broad uh, let's say area of artificial intelligence and in particular we're going to look at it from the perspective of compression so to talk about it, so I'm not going to talk about my own work for the let's say first half of the talk, but more like how what is the right way to connect, let's say how we teach or how we study computer science and what we do in machine learning as well as in artificial intelligence by thinking about it from the perspective of compressing a data that we want to send to another person. And then this is going to be based on some of the earlier work by Yorma Risanen, you know, who talked about the minimum description length. I'm going to talk about it a bit later. And also a bit, a bit of, let's say, information theory. It turned out that Claudio Shannon in 50s or the 40s kind of solved everything back then, just that it took, took a lot of many decades for people to realize that Claude Shannon already solved the problem. 
And then I guess that's the issue with the Claude Shannon is that the, you know, I, I, I heard one uh, story is that the, he was invited to give a talk at the information theory conference in 70s or 60s. And then he was sitting there and he told the audience that the, he couldn't tell a single thing about, uh, he couldn't tell what was actually discussed at the conference, not a single thing. And somehow everyone thought that the, everyone was considering him as the father of the information theory. And it turned out that that's almost always true. You know, he came up with something fundamental and it took us about half a century to figure out that the, in fact, that's the fundamental idea behind the artificial intelligence as well. But anyway, uh, I was to say going off the script too much. All right, let's get back to it. So the, what we learn often in computer science curriculum, in particular in the undergrad years, in, uh, especially in the first couple of years is about programming. What is the right way to think about, uh, think about let's say problem solving from the perspective of being able to come up with an algorithm that is executable by a computer or the often a digital computer, although you know, it doesn't really have to. On the other hand, uh, and then we have machine learning. And then we often think of machine learning or artificial intelligence as a rather different paradigm against the programming. So in programming, what we think about is that, okay, so what is the problem? We need to think about it really hard. And then based on what we think about, we're going to write down an algorithm and then make computer execute it. On the other hand, when we think about machine learning, we think about a problem, but we often don't know how to solve it. So we're going to make computer algorithms or the software to solve a problem for us. But are they really two different things? Let's see you know, how they are actually equivalent at the end of the day. So we're going to assume a very simple problem. So Bob is a lazy user. And then what Bob doesn't really want to do is to do anything himself. So, and he wants to actually know, given a binary string, the string that consists of ones and zeros, how, how many ones there are given a string. But Bob is so lazy that he's not going to solve this problem himself, but he's going to ask a smart programmer, Ellis, well, it's, uh, it's actually a pretty, per it's a coincidence, but okay, it's an Ellis, and then you know, the Ellis here is also a smart programmer. So Bob is always, lazy user Bob is always going to ask Ellis, how many ones there are in this any given string. And then every time Bob asks Alice, Alice is smart, so Alice is going to give the answer to Bob. But at some point, because Alice is smart, she's going to get a bit sick of answering Bob's question over and over. So as a smart programmer, what Alice is going to do is, she's going to program, make a program that is counting ones in a binary string, and then send the program to Bob so that the Bob can run this program over and over instead of asking Ellis for the answer every time there's a new string. Now, if you think about it from this angle, what Ellis has done is programming, but you can also view this as compressing all the future answers that Ellis should have sent to Bob. So instead of answering Bob's question every single time Bob sends the question to Ellis, Ellis decided to just compress all the future answers in one program and then just send the program so that the Bob can execute it himself. Now, Alice doesn't have to answer Bob's question over and over. So in, in other words, programming turned out to be a much more efficient way to transmit all those answers, even into the future to, uh, from, for Bob, uh, Alice to Bob. So there comes the idea of the efficiency. And then now we can now see how much uh, has been saved in terms of communication. And then what is the right way to look at the size of the program or any kind size of the data? Because you are all computer scientists, we're all computer science. We're going to say that the, we are going to represent it as a string of binary numbers. So that's going to be bits. So we're going to count the number of bits. And then if you have a program that is F, we're going to look at the length of this program. And then we know that the any given, let's say data, of length, let's say f, we can encode it into the log two of f bits. So Alice is sending Bob log two of f bits instead of potentially infinite number of bits that she needs to send because Bob may be may you know like never stop asking Alice over and over because Bob is just so lazy. And then in this particular case, now what is the goal of Alice? So Alice's goal is theoretically to minimize the length of the program. So shorter the program she can write, then smaller the number of bits she, can, she needs to consume in order to send the program to Bob. 
And then the idea of Kolmogorov complexity comes in here, is uh, uh, where the Kolmogorov complexity is defined to be the length of the shortest possible program. Because as we all know, we can write a program that's extremely verbose and extremely slow. But at the same time, if you're a good programmer, you can write the same program in a way that is much more efficient. So then the goal of Alice, the smart programmer here, is to write a program that's as short as possible. And then that actually translates directly to saving the number of bits that Alice needs to send to Bob. Unfortunately, it turned out that the Kolmogorov complexity, which is an extremely nice concept, is uncomputable. So when I say uncomputable, it's not even you know, the, uh, some, uh, a notion of it's going to take so long that it doesn't really make sense to compute. That's not what I'm talking about. So Kolmogorov complexity is just not computable because it doesn't exist. And then you, if you have taken, let's say, either the course on automata theory or if you have taken the discrete mathematics, yeah, discrete mathematics from the computer science, I, I, I recall well because I, I took it like three times uh, while I was in undergrad years. Um, so if you took that course, then you have learned about the halting problem, right? How the halting problem is a problem that cannot exist, strictly saying, because why does then, uh, why can't, uh, and then the reason why it can't exist is because we actually run into a paradox. So there is a logical impossibility. And then it turned out that the halting problems, uh, let's say paradox, applies identically to the Kolmogorov complexity as well. And then on the side, uh, I'm actually showing you one particular example where it actually shows that the, the Kolmogorov complexity function, if it exists, it can output either of the two numbers, but we cannot really determine which is the right wing, right one. So we can't really compute the Kolmogorov complexity because it actually doesn't exist in reality. But even then, we actually do care about the program, program length. Not because you know, the, uh, we want to find the shortest possible program, which turned out to not exist, but because the program length turned out to be precisely how we get the compression and the length of the compressed data. So let's think about it from this angle. So instead of trying to write a program, Alice decided to get all those questions from Bob and then come up with all these answers and then now tries to compress it. So after compression, what Alice is going to do is send a decompression algorithm along with the compressed number of bits. So before, Alice was just sending about the counting problem. But here, we're not going to say that the problem is counting. Perhaps it's not a counting problem. We don't know. So what Alice is going to do is Alice is going to answer all those questions as much as she can. And then once she got all those answers, without sending back those answers to Bob yet, she's going to compress it with the amazing compression algorithm and then send Bob a decompressing algorithm together with the compressed data. So if you view it from this angle, the programming is indeed compression, just that the programming in very strict sense turned out to be the optimal compression algorithm. So the goal is for us to find the compression that is so good so that the regardless of how long the data that we want to compress, so the number of the answers we want to compress, we can always compress them into a finite number of bits. So the program turned out to be just an amazing way for us to compress the data. But obviously, that's not that easy. That's not that easy. That's why we're going to now move, in, move away a bit from programming to compression. So then what is a kind of a say more, slightly more detailed view of this compression view of the programming is that the Bob is going to send bunch of questions in advance. And then now Alice is going to try to figure out the answers to the first, let's say, uh, first few of them. And then based on that, she's going to compress them and then send Bob the decompressor and the number of bits, uh, compressed bits. So usually, uh, originally, it would have taken, let's say, n times the log two of L, well, where L is the one of the all possible answers for each of the question, and then n is the number of questions. Now, instead, L is needs to just send n times k, where k is the number of compressed bits. So that's going to be so much smaller than log two of L, plus some constant number of bits to describe how to decompress all this compressed data. 
So what does that mean is that the, if we had the perfect program, this k becomes zero because you know, we really don't need to compress it. We essentially compress it to zero. All we need to send is this decompression algorithm and then Bob can just run it for any question Bob has. Unfortunately, as I just talked about it, we often don't know how to write perfect program for the problems that we want to solve. So one of the example is the self-driving car. Self-driving is really weird in a sense that the almost everyone in the world, regardless of whether they were born to a car racer or not, after about 20 hours of instruction, they can all drive. We can all drive. If you haven't driven, it's okay. In about 20 hours of instruction from a people who know how to drive, you'll be able to drive perfectly. So in other words, we know how to drive. Every single one of us knows how to drive and then can learn to drive very quickly. So that problem must be solvable because we have, let's say, 7 billion machines that are able to drive a car on the street after about 20 hours of instruction. But it turned out we don't know how to write the program to drive a car. We like literally don't know. So one of my uh, former PhD students who just graduated, Jason Lee, he joined uh, Tesla, the autopilot team earlier this year. I haven't heard back from him. And then Tesla is not driving better than before. So it does look very, very difficult. And then he's like the, one of the best students I've ever instructed and you know, he couldn't solve anything. So it is really, really difficult. What that means is that the, we can't really stick to this kind of conventional paradigm of let's think about the problem really, really carefully and then come up with this perfect program that is going to compress all future answers into a zero bit. It's impossible for us to do so. So we really have to stick to this view of, we're going to try our best to compress it, and then we're not going to send only the decompression algorithm, but there will be some residual bits that we need to send for every question. And then we now have to then think about, okay, what is the right way to compress? What is the right way to compress? And then if you have taken the discrete math course or the algorithms course or the communications theory course, then you already know the answer. So what is the answer here? Let's think about it from this angle. Now, Alice and Bob are talking to each other. Now, Alice needs to send the answer to Bob, right? So that's the setup we have. And then let's say Alice can, the answer is going to be one of these four possible options. So now Alice needs to tell Bob that answer is going to be one of these four options. If Alice and Bob have absolutely no idea about each other, so Bob doesn't know about Alice, Alice doesn't know about Bob, then how many bits do we need on average? Because it could be any one of these four options. So Alice really needs to use as many bits as possible in order to encode all of them. All four options are equally likely. And then if you write the expected code length, then it's going to be about 1.5 bits. But in reality, you're going to use two bits, right? Because, you know, these bits are discrete. So you need two bits in order to tell, for Alice to tell Bob which one of the four options is the answer. But let's say, but let's say the Bob and Alice are extremely good friends. So Bob knows what, El, what Alice thinks. And then Alice knows that Bob knows what she thinks as well. And then let's say the answer, Bob figured out that the Alice answer is going to be only one of two options rather than four options. So now Bob is predictive of what Alice thinks. In that case, we actually don't need two bits. We only need one bit, right? Because it's going to be only one of two options rather than four options because Alice and Bob know each other very, very well. And then Bob knows that answer is going to be either one of two, according to Alice. So Alice needs to just tell Bob, send one bit in order to distinguish between these two bits. Now, let's say they are extremely good friends, like the best friends ever kind of situation. In that case, Bob knows what Alice thinks already. And Alice knows that the Bob knows what Alice thinks. So they don't need to talk at all. So Bob already knows what Alice thinks. So Alice doesn't have to tell Bob what she thinks. So then you did zero bit in order to communicate the answer. And then what this actually tells us is that if, if Bob can predict what Alice is going to say, then the number of bits that Alice needs to send to Bob to tell Bob what Alice wanted to say goes down. In other words, 
if we can make rough but correct prediction, we can reduce the number of bits on average. Thereby, prediction is compression. So the best way to compress data is to be able to tell a predict what the data is going to be. And if I could predict it really, really well, the number of bits I need in order to recover the original data goes down significantly. So what do we do? That's where the machine learning comes in. Now, Ellis, a smart programmer, receive all those questions from Bob. Now, Ellis is going to look at the first, let's say, M many questions, and then look at the answers, and then trying to figure out or use a machine learning algorithm to build a predictive model of the answer given the question. And then let's say, because Ellis is smart, this is going to be an amazingly predictive model, a very good predictive model. Then using this predictive model, Ellis can compress all the future answers and then send back the predictive model along with the residuals. So the ones that could not be predicted perfectly. If you recall from here, in the second case, where Bob was able to predict Ellis, Ellis' thought process to a degree that he, know, he knew that there could be two possible answers, Ellis still had to tell Bob or send Bob one bit in order to disambiguate this remaining uncertainty between answer three and answer four. So that's going to be the residual that Ellis needs to send Bob together with the predictive model. And according to the information theory, this is where the information theory comes in. If we have a predictive model that's going to be a distribution over the answers given the input, so that's going to be P of Y given X that is on the bottom right side of the slide, then we actually know how many bits we need in order to disambiguate among those few likely answers. And then that's going to be log two of the probability of the correct answer that Alice wanted to send Bob under this predictive model. So now the number of the bits that Alice needs to send Bob is going to be the constant number of bits that she needs to pay in order to send the predictive model. That is a P of Y given X. And then we need to have, we need to pay log two of the P of the actual answer that needed to be sent for each of the question Bob sent to Alice. And then you just sum them up. So it looks almost exactly like what the compression, decompression, residual, or the compressed bits were, because essentially the prediction is indeed compression. And then if we could do it for the indefinitely, so for all possible future questions, that actually um, ends up being the concept of generalization. So this is here, what I meant by saying that, okay, it turned out that the programming and prediction that is driven by the machine learning are essentially the same uh, or the two different sides of the same coin and then the coin turned out to be compression. So the data is there. Uh, so the program is a way to compress all possible answers in the future for any of the pro problems that you want the program to solve. But, that, but then it turned out that that's equivalent to compressing all those answers. It turned out, of course, the compression is kind of difficult or the perfect compression is difficult because we know that there are a lot of problems. We don't know how to come up with this perfect compression algorithm. That's where we get this idea that, okay, to compress well, we need to predict well. And then that's where we use the idea of the machine learning to build this kind of predictive model and using the predictive model in order to compress the data. And we let the Ellis send the predictive model instead of the decompression algorithm together with all these residuals. And then these residuals are there to disambiguate among few very likely answers. And then, so why, why did I spend like, I don't know, past to say almost 30 minutes talking about this is because it turned out this actually tells us a lot about not only what machine learning is or the programming is, but also it tells us a lot about what data is. Because if you think about it, so what was programming? Programming turned out to be the optimal way to compress the answers. And the answers, those are data. Answers are data. So what that means is that in fact, program, any software that you write is in a sense, a some compressed form of the data that you wanted to send to your software's users. And then the same thing with the machine learning algorithms. 
is that the, you build all those let's say, deep neural networks that are gigantic and then can make all those amazing predictions. It turned out that that's actually just a, another view of the data. It's often lossy. That's the reason why we, the predictions turn to be, uh, tend to be not perfect, perfect. But as your prediction gets better and better, the model itself is just data as it is. So you can't really tell the difference between machine learning model that has been trained on the data, data itself, and the program that's going to solve the problem that we wanted to solve. These are all the same thing. What that means is that the, now we can use this kind of, let's say, paradigm to analyze the data itself instead of the machine learning algorithms or the programs, but we're going to analyze the data. <laughs> so we, so this is the paper that we presented earlier uh, this year at ICML together with Ethan Perez, who is a PhD student of mine and he's graduating soon. And also Dao Kila, who is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. And then we named it Risanen Data Analysis after Yorma Risanen, who actually passed away last year. Uh, because you know, the Yorma Risanen is the one who kind of, let's say, came up with or the proposed a whole notion of using the idea of description length in order to, um, let's say, in order to quantify the quality of machine learning algorithms. I'm going to get to that soon here. And it turned out that Yorma is also the alumni of the Alta University. So you know, I thought, okay, let's try to use the name of the, you know, the our alumni there, yes. So, but yeah, the, initially what got me and Ethan and Dow to talk about this whole, let's say, information theory, compression and whatnot. I mean, I think some people are just you know, so smart that they just come up with the kind of research agenda. But in my case, I often have to have a real problem that I don't know how to solve in order to come up with some research agenda. And then that problem was multi-hop question answering. So you may have heard about the recent advances, like the dramatic advances in our ability to build a question answering systems and they're often driven by the successes in deep learning. And then you know, the, what we realize is that the, a lot of the question answering databases or the data sets that we have built earlier turned out to be too simple because how we build a data set often is driven by what we can do at that moment. What that means is that the, the data sets that we created earlier on when we didn't know how to build the amazing question answering system tend to be the problems that can be solved very easily once we kind of, let's say, make the jump later on. And then because of that, uh, a few years back, people started to talk about what is the right way to build a more challenging and more realistic question answering data sets. And then one thing that people started to delve into was to build a question answering data set where the questions or the questions can only be answered if a system could make multiple hops of reasoning. All right, that sounds reasonable. If you just hear, if you just hear it or the read it, that sounds a bit reasonable. But then you start wondering about this a bit because what does it mean to have multiple hops of reasoning? So here's one question I took out of the paper where the uh, hot pot QA data set was proposed. The question is, what city is the Marine Air Control Group 28 located in? And then there were two paragraphs that were provided as context for the question answering system to answer this question. In first paragraph, paragraph A, there was a sent, uh, the paragraph A talked about the, let's say the Marine Tactical Air Command Squadron, uh, Squadron 28, and then the Marine Corps Air, Bay, uh, Air Station Cherry Point. Paragraph B talked about where that Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point is located. And then it turned out to be located in Havelock, North Carolina, USA. So given this information, their example was that, okay, in the first step of reasoning, whatever reasoning is, first step, what should be done? So this QA system needs to figure out where Marine Air Control Group 28 is stationed. And then based on the paragraph A, is going to figure out that the, okay, the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point is where the Marine Air Control Group 28 is stationed. And then what's the second step is to figure out in which city the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point is located. And then based on the paragraph B, the answer should be half of North Carolina, which turned out to be answered to the original question. So you need two steps of reasoning. That's what they said. Sounded a bit reasonable. Okay, fine. But then I was like, what if my QA system decides to do something different. First question 
in which cities are U U.S. Marine Corps airfields located? It's going to list up all those let's say, cities where the Marine Corps airfields are located. Step two, in which base is the Marine Air Control Group 28 station? It's going to answer that it's the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. Step three, which among the cities from the step one is Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point located? Then you can actually answer that it's going to be uh, Havelock, North Carolina. This looks actually reasonable as well. If I push it a bit uh, further, then why can't my question answering system just answer it in one step? Maybe it's just very smart that it's going to read the paragraph A and B at once and then answer the question in one step. Why is this not any more desirable than the first, let's say, multi hop case or the second multi hop, let's say, reasoning case that I just made it up? So it turned out that it's not, it's a really an ill defined problem even to think about what it means to have a multi hop reasoning question answering data set because it's not really trivial to determine whether multi-hop reasoning is necessary, not to mention that you know, the, uh, we, we need to have a huge debate about what reasoning itself is, but it turned out that it's not really even trivial, even if we all agree on what reasoning is. And then you know, there are many reasons. One of them is you know, if there is a, some kind of common sense that has been learned by the question answering system, maybe question answering system itself can simply bypass a lot of these hopes of reasoning that are necessary because it just knows the answer. And then there may be many different ways to have arrived at the same an, uh, answer, then you know, how can we know that the one of them is indeed the way to answer such a question? So we, what we did was to, instead of a case, and, but, but regardless, you know, a lot of people have been coming up with the different, let's say, algorithms to solve these multi-hop question answering uh, problems better. But then you know, the, uh, Ethan, Dao, and I got completely stuck at this point of, okay, what is this multi-hop question answering? to start with. So we got really stuck and then we started to think about it uh, a lot about the problem itself instead of the solution because we couldn't really come up with a solution to a problem that we didn't know what it was. I mean, that's a, a bit difficult, right? So then you know, the, let's just zoom out, abstract out some of the details and then let's try to look at the, what this problem of multi-hop QA is. And it turned out it's really nothing uh, that different from the usual question answering except that we are going to create a few more features using some external mechanism. So we have the original input X that consists of the, some of the contextual or the evidence paragraphs together with a question that needs to be answered. But then there will be some of the features that are going to be created based on this original input. And then what are these features? Features are those multiple hops of reasoning that we just talked about. Some of the sub questions and there's uh, corresponding answers. And all we do is to concatenate them and then fit this concatenated input into a question answering system that's going to give us the answer. So multi of QA sounded kind of, let's say, pretty cool, you know, making a hopes of the reasoning and so on. But at the end of the day, is we start with the input and then we somehow have this, what we are going to call multi of reasoning box that's going to look at the input and then give us all those extra information that we can augment the original input with and then we just fit the augmented input to a question answering model that's going to give us the answer. So we're going to look at the multi of QA from this angle. And then we are going to call this step or the function that generates this extra augmentation or augmented features as the subroutine. So a quick so question. Then, yeah, Can I yeah, ask? yeah, please. So where do these features, maybe you're going to get into this, where do these features come from? Do they come from the passage or do they come from some knowledge? Uh, Base or some yeah. common sense reasoning. Think, yeah. So yes, uh, precisely. I'm going to get to that one, but here for now, I'm going to say that this somebody created this f and then gave me. I'm going to just assume that this somebody gave me this f that I can just use. Okay. Yeah. So and then you know, if I simplify it even further, so we are essentially comparing two cases. If I wanted to know if the multiple hops of reasoning is really useful, and then if I assume that this function subroutine f is supposed to solve this problem of multiple hops of reasoning, except for the final step of extracting the answer, then what, I'm do what we need to do is to compare these two systems. The first system, g0, is going to take us to input the original uh, question, question and the paragraphs, and then I'll put the uh, answer. g1, that takes as the input, 
the original input x as well as the the outcome of this multiple hops of reasoning performed by this subroutine f and then this g1 is going to look at this augmented input and gives us the answer so we just need to compare these two different setups in order to tell whether this subroutine f that is a, uh, conducting multiple hops of reasoning is indeed useful now obviously we need to think about how to compare them now and then it turned out that the this is where those idea of the shortest programs come in let's just uh, not think about f and g h0 g1 being machine learning systems or whatnot so let's say those were just programs that we have then one thing we know is that the this subroutine f is going to be useful is useful if and only if the length of g0 the optimal g0 is greater than greater than the length of this optimal g1 and the reason being that the uh, you can imagine why people love python python has so many libraries already available online and then you can imagine all of them as f so that the using those already pre-built libraries or the pre-released uh, open source libraries the actual code that you need to write g1 is so much shorter than the program that you would have to write had you not had access to those pre-built subroutines or libraries. So the way to tell whether F is useful is to see if you can actually write a program by using F, a, a, a shorter one than the program that we would've gotten without having access to F. So let's just think about why that is the case. If the length of G0 that doesn't use the features coming out of F is actually shorter than the length of the program G1 that actually uses the uh, you know, outcome, output of the subroutine F. What that means is that the, you had to write a code on the G1 that's going to figure out what is the augmented feature so that you can remove it. And then the, for removing that, you had to spend number of bits there. On the other hand, uh, and on other cases that if the length of the G0 and G1 were same, what that means is that the, you essentially didn't need F. You didn't have to use F in order to write a short program because apparently there exists this program that you could have written that is as short as the G1 that uses F, but this G0 doesn't even use F. So F not needed. If when the length, only when, the length of G0 is greater than the length of the G1, that's when we can say that the LOF was actually pretty useful because somehow whatever F did had to be replicated within, as a part of G0 and then that led to a longer program than G1. So it's actually pretty, in, in principle, very easy to evaluate the usefulness of a subroutine F. We're going to implement G0 as well as possible without accessing F, and then we're going to implement G1 as well as possible while F is freely usable. And we just look at the length of these two programs, and if the length of G0 is greater than the length of the G1, we say that the F is helpful. This is an idea how you would actually choose which programming language or the framework to use, right, in some sense, in reality as well. Now, there are two almost equivalent uh, issues that prevent us from using this algorithm as it is. The first one is that the, indeed, the Kolmogorov complexity is not computable. Now, the one caveat there, or the one thing that's going to save us eventually is that the Kolmogorov complexity is computable if we limit the class of programs that we consider. So if we don't limit the class of programs, then we can't really compute the Kolmogorov complexity. But if we say that, okay, class of programs that we're going to consider is limited in a very favorable way, then we can actually compute the Kolmogorov complexity, although it's still very, very difficult. And then the second thing, perhaps even more important, is that the, even if we give up on the true optimality of G0 and G1, we often don't know how to implement G0 and G1. It's almost like, what if you had a LiDAR in your self-driving car? Is having LiDAR useful for having a self-driving car? But to do that, you need to know how to build a self-driving software first, but we don't know how to do that. So we can't really use this kind of, let's say, paradigm to check whether LiDAR is useful or not. And then that is a reason why people haven't figured out whether LiDAR is indeed useful or not for building a self-driving car. Tesla says no, 
and then all the other car companies say yes. So we'll see which one is the uh, correct answer, but we really don't know because we don't know how to program or the code the self-driving softwares. So we're going to actually go to the machine learning side now and then try to approach this problem by replacing programming with prediction. So we're going to, because we know that it's all about compression now, so we're not going to try to write a program ourselves, but we're going to let machine learning algorithms to come up with a good compression algorithm. And then these two issues, almost equivalent ones, they in fact become opportunities instead. So instead of looking at the Kolmogorov complexity, we're going to now look at the so-called minimum description length. So description length is the number of bits you need in order to describe the data you have. But as we know, program, programs are data. So looking at the length of the program, exactly identical to looking at the description length. So the number of bits that you need in order to describe the data. Now, of course, that actually doesn't say much uh, unless you know, we know how to actually compress the data to have this kind of very small description length. And then doing so, we're going to rely on machine learning that is prediction. So we know that we don't know how to write that, uh, that amazing compression algorithm ourselves. So we let machine learning algorithm figure out what is the best compression algorithm or the compressed form. And then the compressed form comes, from, uh, com comes out as a predictive model that is result of learning from data. It's still, uh, unfortunately, uh, uncom it's not computable. Minimum description length is because uh, is equivalent to Kolmogorov complexity, therefore it's not computable. But again, that one, let's say, uh, detail, that is if we limit the class of programs, then we can actually compute the Kolmo uh, you know, Kolmogorov complexity to a certain degree. It's to a certain degree, very expensive still though. And then in the case of the minimum description length, the same thing happens. If we limit the class of the compression algorithms that we consider, then we can actually compute the minimum description length within this compressed, uh, the family of the compression algorithms. And then that's what we do in machine learning always. We always define a some manageable hypothesis space that con contains all possible predictive models that we can get out of this our machine learning algorithm. And then we just find the one that is most predictive of the data, which is most, uh, most efficient compression of the data. And then that, the description length of the data using the predictive model is going to be the one that we're going to use here. And one thing people have realized over the past, let's say, 14 years, most of people have realized over the past, let's say, 10 years, although Jan apparently knew about it, uh, in 1985, in, uh, written down in his dissertation in French, is that the deep learning, the steam neural network, gives us amazing predictive model, thereby allow us to compress the data amazingly well. So we're going to stick to this paradigm of uh, deep learning for getting, approximating the minimum description length or finding a very tight upper bound to the true minimum description length which kind of doesn't exist, but within this uh, fixed uh, hypothesis that it actually does exist. So then yeah, what, what does the description length of the data consist of? There are two things. One is uh, our description of the predictive distribution itself. So that is that we need to send the, our deep neural network so that the Bob now has the deep neural network that was used by Alice in order to compress the data. And then once that is done, now Alice can just send a small number of bits to disambiguate the answer among those you had the few very likely answers that is shared between Bob and Ellis thanks to this shared deep neural network. So we look at these two points. Very unfortunate thing happened <laughs> with the deep learning is that the, it's amazing at prediction, but it turned out that it's amazing at prediction when the models are gigantic. And that these models are gigantic as in so much larger than the data itself. So then you the, we can compress the data, but our model turned out to be larger than data. So we actually don't earn anything in terms of the compression, which is, this is actually in some sense understandable because we said that the models are, machine learning models are data. So you know, at the, as our data gets more complicated and larger, the models do uh, become larger. But then it turned out that with the deep learning, the re, because we rely on this iterative gradient-based optimization, uh, we had to make the neural networks much larger than is necessary 
in order to get a good prediction uh, performance, which is fine if you're just doing some kind of cloud-based inference for, I don't know, taking a, a picture and then you know, detecting where, whether there are buildings and cats or not, that's fine. But for this purpose of understanding how much compression we can do for any given data set, it's really horrible. It doesn't really tell us too much. It's not really a tight upper bound to the true uh, minimum description length. It turned out that uh, Yorma Rissan and the late uh, Rissan and actually knew this was going to be a problem. So in 1984, he actually did write in his uh, almost a book about the minimum description length about this kind this issue. Is that the if you want to send the predictive model directly as it is, they tend to be large because the larger models are bound to be better at prediction. And then Blier, Blier and Olivier in 2018. Uh, kind of reuse this idea or the apply this idea to the modern deep neural networks and then show that indeed it is possible to avoid this issue of having to send gigantic neural network between LS and Bob. Instead, what we're going to do, what we can do is we can send an algorithm itself. So the Ellis can send an algorithm to Bob so that Bob can exactly replicate every single step Ellis is taking so that the, we don't really need the Alice to send the entire model, just Alice needs to make sure that the Alice uses, a bot uses the same data as Alice does in order to train a model. Now, by doing so, we save a lot on the number of bits because deep neural nets tend to be gigantic, but the algorithms that we use in order to train these gigantic models tend to be tiny, tiny. It's just stochastic gradient descent plus a bit of naive form of the reverse mode automatic differentiation, and then that's about it. So it's really tiny if you think about it. So it turned out that if we could do this, then we can indeed compress the data a lot and a lot. And in particular, this is a case when the learning algorithm can be used for more than one data set. We're not going to use the, uh, we're not going to use a unique algorithm for every data set. We're going to use just a, at least needs to send up algorithm once, and then from there on, whenever we have a new problem, we just ensure that the, their initial states are synchronized. And then that's it. From there on, we actually don't need to send the algorithm again. So it can be really efficient. Effectively, the, the first term in this computing the minimum description length. So there were two terms. One was the actual uh, compressed data. And the first one was sending the predictive uh, model. This can essentially go to zero. This disappears completely. So how can we do this? This is called online coding. And then this is where the Ellis and Bob start with the same state of mind, and then they try to synchronize with each other with the minimum number of bits that are being sent from Ellis to Bob. So how do we do that? So at the very beginning, Ellis is going to send this amazing learning algorithm A plus the pseudo random number generator and its initial state to Bob. Now they are completely synchronized. And then Bob is going to send Ellis all the questions he is interested in. The, uh, he's interested in the answers of. Now, given that, Ellis is going to look at a very small number of the first K questions and then just send the answers as they are to Bob. But K can be very small, let's say 10 to 20. Now, what we have is that the Ellis and Bob have the completely synchronized initial state, synchronized algorithm and the synchronized initial data set, x1, y1, all the way to xk, yk. Using this, this initial chunk of the data, Ellis and Bob train a model, and then these models are completely synchronized because even the random numbers are drawn from the same pseudo random number generator with the same initial state. And then once we have this first model, theta1, Ellis now can send the next chunk of labels to Bob in a compressed format using this theta one, the first model, without sending the model itself because Bob already has it, Bob already has it. And then given that, we can now train, so that both Alice and Bob independently train the next model using the first two chunks of the data they have uh, gathered. Now the predictive capability, uh, prediction, let's say it gets better and better. So Alice can now send to Bob a even smaller number of bits to send the answers to the next third chunk. Now, Ellis and Bob have three times more data than the very first chunk. And then we, they can train again independently 
two different models that are perfectly synchronized on this new chunk of the data or the you know all the chunk uh, all the chunks of the data that have been transmitted already and then it continues until the final data point has been resolved and at this point bob now knows all the answers as alice does and then the number of bits that Alice has to, had to spend was quite low because the deep neural nets are amazing at prediction. And there was no need at all to, for Alice to send the actual deep neural network to Bob at all. So this is how we can actually save a lot on the number of bits we need in order to share the algorithm itself for the predictive model. And then that, uh, and then Blier and Olivier in 2018 showed that, that this is an amazing way to estimate the minimum description length or the approximate the upper bound to minimum description length using deep neural networks. So we're going to use this uh, idea to approximate the minimum description length. And then now let's go come back to your idea how we are going to do so. We use this MDL to compute, uh, we compute the MDL of the original data and then we compute the MDL of the original data augmented with this outcome from the subroutine that does this multiple hops of reasoning or whatever we want, right? At the end of the day, we start with, yep, sorry, yeah. A, a quick question. Does the original paper that you described in this previous slide, does it guarantee uh -huh. that in the end, Alice and Bob mm -hmm. have the same mm -hmm. model? Yep, yep. So as long as we actually initialize the initial state perfectly, yes, it's going to be, it should be guaranteed. Now, mm -hmm. there are some uh, issues, as in you know, the, uh, sometimes the NVIDIA, you know, like the, uh, they, they do some sloppy job at coding of the QDNN. So there's some, you know, the stochastic behavior there. So there can be a bit of an issue. But generally, if we assume that the Alice and Bob have the same determinist, deterministic computers, then this is going to be perfectly synchronized all the way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the minimum description length of the data alone versus minimum description of the data plus this augmented features. If we can compress the data further, the labels more so when we have access to this extra augmented features, then means that the, this extra augmented features were much uh, useful. If not, we didn't really need these extra features. So instead of writing a program, we trained this so many deep neural networks in order to check the, what would be the minimum description length of these labels in order to solve this problem. And then we, if we see if we can actually compress the labels even further, if we had access, had we had access to this augmented features F. So I'll come out of this multiple hops of reason. Now it turned out that there are two practical issues that are relatively easy to uh, address. One is that the, the data points that we often work with are uh, IID in a sense uh, in that you know, they don't really have any in here on order, but this online coding algorithm, not the MDL, online coding algorithm we use does rely on some ordering of the data points. So what we do is we just run this multiple times uh, with uh, random permutations and then we look at the average as well as the variance there. And then another issue is that the, we did say that okay, we're going to look at the dim neural, uh, dim, dim neural net for this purpose, but there are so many possible dim neural networks and there are so many hyperparameters. So in other words, there's no one best algorithm for all the data sets. So what we do is that we're going to train M prime many models and then pick the best one for each block. But that's, that doesn't actually incur too many bits because every time, every time we, Alice just needs to send Bob which model to use. And then that only incurs log two of M prime bits for each of the uh, blocks. So it's actually perfectly fine to do so. So we look at many different ways, but it turned out that these two practical issues are not the big of an issue. So first one is that the variance is pretty small across the different permutation. Second one is that we could just use the ensemble. We could just uh, average the predictions from the M prime main models. And then that was just as good as picking the best one every time. So in order to check whether this RDA, so recent data analysis makes sense, we started with a synthetic data set called Clever from 2016, where the entire data set was actually created from the, the scripts. And then because it was created from scripts, we know some of the things that just need to be it need to be known by a model for it to answer correctly in the middle. So 
the, some the models that are going to solve the problems in, uh, uh, solve the problems of clever. Some of the things just have to be inferred in order for questions to be answered correctly. And then now we can use that knowledge that we have just coming out of the fact that the, this is a synthetic data, we can now check whether the relational data analysis can tell us whether those necessary intermediate steps are indeed necessary because all those intermediate steps are the subroutine F. In short, now it was like perfectly reproducing what are needed. In the case of integer comparison, uh, an example question would be whether there are more cubes than spheres. In this case, if we use the oracle subroutine that's going to count the number of cubes and then count the number of spheres, we could dramatically lower the description length of the data. What that means is that the program that's going to solve this problem, this QA problem, question answering, is can be so much shorter if it could access the subroutines that does the counting. Now, in the case of attribute comparison, an example would be uh, whether the metal object the same of uh, same color as a rubber thing. Now, in this case, the oracle, so the oracle F, would be the one that's going to check the color of the metal object, color of the rubber thing. And it turned out in this case you need to have access to the both uh, the twice, you need to have access to this Oracle twice in order to save. If you have access to only once, uh, the Oracle once, then it doesn't really save us because anyway, it will have to learn to detect the color of the object. Now in the case of same property as, it turned out that the Oracles don't really help and then that was actually kind of known from the time of building a data set. So it looks like yeah, the RDA is indeed a useful tool here. Um, so we went to this hot pot QA that is a multi-hub QA data set people were using quite actively back then so, and to try to figure out if the multiple hops of reasoning actually is useful and it turned out that it is extremely helpful if there is the oracle that is able to do this multiple steps of the reasoning perfectly for us. So figuring out what are the reasoning that needs to be done and then what is the outcome of the reasoning, if these can be done perfectly, we can save on the number of bits dramatically compared to not having access to this oracle. But it turned out that if we have to learn to do this multiple of reasoning, we tried various things, including the, some of the algorithms that we came up with uh, ourselves a year ago. It turned out that if the save, saving this description length is pretty modest at best. And then the really interesting thing we noticed is that if you train the uh, this QA model from scratch, even with the silver standard, let's say oracles, we could get some, let's say, save in the number of bits in order to uh, compress the data. But if we use a pre-trained model, such as BERT, or we use the Roberta here, the save disappears completely. Unless you have Oracle, you cannot really compress the data further. Uh, even with all these supposedly multiple hops of reasoning that is being done by our own learned subroutines. And then what we believe is that the this happens because these pre-trained language models already know how to perform these rudimentary subroutines, such as to say, okay, tell me all the named entities in this, these paragraphs. Tell me all these to say necessary information. So they're, you know, they're providing the augmented features is pretty useless because a pre-trained model already knows how to do, perform all those to say subroutines already. And then from here on, you know, I think we got a bit, uh, let's say, excited and we tried it on the every possible data set we could see back then. And then, you know, the, uh, we could use this uh, by, uh, for analyzing the importance of the features as well. So not only the subroutines, but any feature of any data or the, any input is something that has been computed by some oracle based on something. So by removing those features and then see if the description length increases, we can tell whether those features were really important. And then using that idea, we were able to check what kind of words in a sentence are really important to solve various problems. For instance, in the case of the natural language inference, where the goal is to build a system that's going to tell us, given two sentences, hypothesis and premise, whether uh, premise and hypothesis, whether the hypothesis contradicts premise or Intel's premise, or they're just neutral, completely unrelated to each other. In the case of the original Stanford Natural Language Inference data set, nouns turned out to be super important. You remove the noun, the description length just sh shoots up. 
So nouns are super important. And then that, what, that was actually the reason why people stopped using STEM for natural language inference because that was the annotator artifact, is that the, the, if there were overlapping nouns, entailment. No overlaps, neutral. If there is an antonym, all right, uh, that's a contradiction. So the multi-NLI, which actually was created by the same author with a better or the refined um, uh, refined annotator in, uh, instruction, the nouns are now impossibly useless. So in fact, by removing nouns, you can compress the data even further. So look at the noun. So the model that looks at the noun is going to, you know, is going to completely fail. On the other hand, adjectives and adverbs became suddenly extremely important, which makes more sense because those things actually do tell us a lot about the logical relationship between different objects in a sentence. And then the interesting thing is that the adversarial natural language uh, inference data sets that were created out of the multi genre MNLI, they turned out to continue to keep this importance of the adjectives, but it reduced the importance of the adverbs, which was a bit weird while keeping the unimportance of the nouns as well as the prepositions. So it looks like you the, this RDA is indeed giving us a lot of, uh, confirms a lot of the intuitions that we had before. Although it also gave us some, let's say, uh, answer to the this debate that people have been having. So in all these problems, text classification, there's always this question that the, does the order of words matter? Does it actually matter? If we just permute all those words, can it work? And then almost every year during the past four to five years, there has been at least two papers that says that the word order matters. And then the other paper, word order doesn't matter at all. And then that happens every single year. According to our analysis, it turned out the word order does matter because whenever we have the order, we can compress it further. Now, why did people, why, why, why did people actually draw an incorrect conclusion? Probably because uh, they were looking at a very small validation set and then look at the small uh, accuracy and the small validation set. What that means is that the, they were being a victim of high variance estimate of the generalization error. So that's the reason why they were just changing their minds every year from one paper to another. But when you look at a much low variance estimate like the uh, MDL with the online coding, it's very clear that the word order does matter. But the, the degree to which it matters uh, differs from one data set to another, but across all those data sets we have looked, in, looked at, word order actually does matter. We have uh, many more experiments in the paper, such as the impact of the gendered words in some of the languages where the genders, uh, words and genders are pre go together quite, quite often. We looked at the impact of the natural language explanation. We have also looked at the so-called word level rationales and whatnot. And then they, you know, RDA often confirms our suspicions or the uh, intuitions. And sometimes they yeah, reveal some things that we didn't expect as well. So just to, before I wrap it up, you know, some of the related works, of course, the minimum description length, very old concept. It's not that we, we've used it for the first time. That's definitely not the case. Uh, especially recently, uh, Voira and Tito of 2020, and then you know, the, the paper from my own PhD, former PhD, so Will Whitney and uh, others from last year as well, and then Lofring et al. this year, they all used the minimum description length, but how they used the minimum description length was to check whether the algorithm works better or not. On the other hand, we are very much into, let's say, let's look at the data itself, and uh, how to look at the, you know, data or you know, whether some data or the task contains certain properties in order to check that already from 2016 and 17, people proposed the, uh, some concept called model probing. So they're going to try to build a new data set and then plug in some kind of classifier in the middle of these deep neural networks in order to tell whether these deep neural nets are able to extract certain features that are necessary in order to solve this small, let's say, probing uh, task. It turned out that it's not really the best way to go about because the probing set tends to be too small. The variance you get from the uh, variance you get from the estimating generalization error often kind of kills you when you try to make a very firm conclusion. That's the reason why everyone flips their conclusion every uh, every year essentially. And of course, you know this. What we did was along the line of data set analysis and understanding. We're going for a much more automated approach, but you know, often you really need to look at the data as well. So to summarize, uh, 
turned out that the uh, programming, that's what uh, all the computer science undergrads are suffering to learn, and the machine learning, where I believe that the older grad students are nowadays suffering to learn, are two sides of the same coin, and then the coin turned out to be compression. Uh, and you know, it is compression in the sense that the data needs to be transferred, and then the data is just a set of answers. So a set of answers that the program should give to the user, or a set of answers that our predictive machine learning system need to use in order to drive a car automatically. All these things are data. And then what program or the predictive model does is to compress it as well as possible. And then this actually goes to the principle of Occam's razor in the sense that the what is the true generating pro, uh, process of behind data? The true generating process is the smallest possible stochastic process that's going to reserve in this data, uh, re reproduce this data as faithfully as possible. So if you think about it from this angle, we can now look at the data and then see what kind of information is in it or the, what was the true data generating process all of this data to understand the data itself. So training all these machine learning systems or writing a program is our way to figure out the properties of this true generating process behind data. And then you know, we kind of say, test it as a very first step, uh, how to use this minimum description length in order to draw some conclusions about the data a bit better. It's not that much better, by the way. It's actually a pretty horrible computation only thing because we need to train a deep neural net over and over. But it actually does get us kind of one step beyond you know, what we were doing so far to analyze this kind of high dimensional, you know, the high volume data. And then it's going to be interesting how we can actually improve it or use it to get more insight into the data that we handle. And it's been about an hour and 10 minutes. And I think uh, at least I, I, I can't really tell how, how long was the uh, colloquium? Was it an hour and a half, I think? No, it's actually two hours. So it's two okay. hours. Okay, <laughs> I see. Okay, okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. All right. Uh, so then you had the, uh, I actually did prepare two parts to the talk. So this was actually the kind of long first uh, part, like two thirds of the talk. But then you had the, uh, I want to see if there's any questions on this part. And then you had the, if there are some questions, I can actually answer them and have some discussion. Uh, and then after that, if time permits, I can actually talk a bit about future learning and uh, prompt selection with the uh, language modeling. Uh, if, if time, you know, if you have time. Is there any questions from the students in the Zoom room, meeting room? Yes. Okay, there's a question in the chat. It's pretty unusual to have this immediate questioning. I actually prepared a question where I thought of one, but I'll ask it later. This may be okay. a slightly unrelated question to today's presentation. What projects or things are you doing at Genentech? Plus, in terms of compression mm. and decompression, there are huge amounts of biological data that can be compression, as I know. Right, yeah, uh, I mean, it is indeed a bit uh, unrelated, but uh, the very first slide of my title uh, slide of the, you know, the slide that did have Genentech, so I can actually tell you a bit about it. Uh, so I actually have been working together with the Rich Bono, who's a professor of biology and computer science at New York University, since about 2017 on modeling proteins. And then you know, the, the reason why we started working on that was at some point I realized, and then you know, the Rich and I realized is that the, what I teach in my course uh, titled Deep Learning for Natural Language Processing had absolutely no content about natural language, except for some of the homework assignments. And we were thinking that the, perhaps then that might mean that the, you know, all these algorithms are more generally applicable beyond natural language processing. And then you know, the, some of the applications we looked at included the physics, you know, the uh, social science and so on. But you know, the, eventually we decided to look at the proteins because proteins are kind of a fascinating thing. It's uh, nano machines. They actually do look like the machines in the factories and whatnot. They have, you know, they have motors and they have you know, the legs and whatnot. They do all those crazy stuff. But the blueprint of any protein you can imagine is just a one dimensional sequence. It's really just a sequence of amino acids. And we decided to look at some of these sequence models that we've been using for machine translation, natural language processing in 2017. We've been working on this little by little. 
But then you know, the, uh, you know, ultimately we wanted to do the protein design. So we wanted to create a de novo protein out of this algorithm, the algorithm. And then you know, the last year we thought, oh, well, it looks like that we have a really nice algorithm that can do this our, ourselves. Uh, we had a we, you know, we had to choose between writing a grant proposal and submit it to NIH and hoping that it was going to be funded within, let's say, two rounds or so, or uh, making a startup and then go to venture capitals, uh, capitalists and then get funding. And then you know, the, as far as I can tell, the second one is so much faster than going to NIH. So we created a company earlier this year and then we were finishing our first round of fundraising and we hired some people. We set up all those benefits, HR related stuff. And then you know, we started talking to the, some of the potential partners, one of which was Genentech. And uh, three days before closing the seed round, uh, Genentech said you know, they wanted to buy us. So we sold the company, we became part of it. So the, we are still a, a working on the same problem. There is a protein design with the machine learning algorithms that we have designed. But more particular, we are now working on antibody design, the novel antibody design. So we are building up the team, and then the team is spread between uh, New York City and South San Francisco, where the Genetech is headquartered. It's pretty cool. It's, uh, there are very interesting things. And then you're right, a lot of biological data can be compressed. That's definitely true. Uh, and then you know, we are indeed looking at all this, let's say, recent data analysis and other tools too, for the purpose of analysis as well. Although our main thing at the moment is to actually come up with a model that is able to generate a completely new unseen, let's say antibodies that are going to bind to any arbitrary target that's going to happen in the future and then have an active learning loop that includes the actual wet labs. So that's, that's what, we do, uh, what, what we do at Janet, I guess. Yeah, very exciting. Um, thanks for that answer. We have two more questions in the chat. Thanks for your talk. Okay. Uh, this is from, oh, sorry, uh, three more questions. Uh, so that first question was from Kyung Hoon Her, and this second question is from one of our faculty members, Kyung Ho. Thanks for the great talk. This view programming is compression is ML sounds really interesting. How can we understand higher order problems, programs that generate programs, ML that generating ML generating ML? Can we view these things also mm. as compression? Yeah. So this is a fascinating uh, thing in the sense that the much of the way how I illustrated the whole thing does uh, assume the stationarity in a sense that the questions are not going to change. So or the underlying, let's say, mechanism of the how to answer the questions is not going to change throughout the conversation between Alice and Bob. So that was the assumption. But of course, when we go into a more advanced, let's say, topics in machine learning, we have to get into a bit of online learning, active learning, reinforcement learning and whatnot where the the environment may be stationary, but the the active component of our machine learning algorithm in fact does make the data stream to become non-stationary. So in that case, what is the right way to think about this kind of compression? And my sense is that the from this from this point of on, you know, we need to think about a generalization even more in a sense that the, what is the best way to Query. So now the Alice actually talks to Bob as well. It's not only Bob talking to Alice. So they, so far, Bob has been just feeding the questions to Alice and then Alice tried to answer it. But now if Alice can actually talk to Bob in shaping what kind of question Bob is going to ask, now we can actually be much more aggressive in compression because now the Alice has an option to give information to Bob about what Alice thinks. So from that perspective, the whole idea of the compression still stays, but we can be much more aggressive in how we can compress it further because we now have a control over what kind of question Bob is going to ask. Now, unfortunate thing is that the, it does make it a bit difficult to think of what is the right way to evaluate this whole thing. Because depending on the, what kind of information Alice gave to Bob, the whole dynamics changes. So the number of bits that we can compress the data into cannot be compared across different algorithms because the data that we compress changes itself. So you know, at the, in online learning and active learning, we often talk about the regrets instead is that the, had I had uh, access to the future, then you know, what would I have done in order to do better? And then look at the difference between the decision that I made before and then you know, the decision that I would have made. But that one is totally out of my, uh, 
you know, field of uh, expertise and interests at the moment. So I don't really have the answer to that, but the compression does continue to matter, yes. Probably okay. be much better, yeah. Yeah, um, wow, it, it, it sounds like you're opening up a whole entire research field. Um, <laughs> Okay, a uh, question from Han Sumin. Thanks for your talk. If I understood correctly, the approach discussed in this lecture takes the machine learning as a data compression. However, isn't this approach only applicable when the historical data set has a clear correlation that is trainable by machine learning? Can this be approach can this approach can be applied to continual learning or zero shot learning, which is the model evolving, or should we or should predict new category or new sample? Yeah, so uh, this is essentially the same question as the pre previous one is that the, if the environment is non-stationary or if the algorithm itself can uh, influence the process by which the data is created, uh, what, we, what I talked about indeed does not apply directly. We need to go move on to the online learning regime. Um, but I think you know, it should be definitely applicable. I'm pretty sure there must be a lot of papers already discussed about this, just that yeah, I'm pretty ignorant about them, yes. But yeah, uh, applicable, much less trivial, but I think it's going to be fun to look into that one. Okay, uh, question from Hyun Soo Kim. Thanks for the insightful talk. I have one quick question. When evaluating how easily a subroutine F can be clearly distinguished from a model, is it somehow predefined? Yeah, so uh, in our case, we have been separating this F out quite carefully and then very explicitly from the main model. Although uh, some of the subroutines were sometimes trained together with the main model. So, you know, at the, uh, together with the Ethan Perez and Dao Killa, the one paper we wrote before this paper uh, at, presented at EMLP 20, 2020, there we actually show that the, we can have this kind of subroutine and then train this kind of, let's say, question decomposition. So getting all those multiple hops of the reasoning or the sub-questions in an unsupervised way. It turned out that we can actually do that and then train the F separately from the main model. And then later on, we plug that in with the main model so that the main model can use the information coming out of F. Now, when the, model, uh, the main model was pre-trained as Ber uh, Roberta, the improvement we would see from improvement that is that the better prediction, which is a you know better compression, that we will see with the this kind of a, say learned uh, subroutine extractions, did not uh, wasn't wasn't really there. It, it wasn't there really. But only when we train a model from scratch, which does much worse in terms of the prediction, thereby you know compression. But in that case, we could see a dramatic, pretty dramatic uh, improvements in terms of data compression by using this kind of even a learned subroutines. So yeah, we have to separate it out. Now, this is a really interesting question is that the, if somebody gave us this one large neural net or whatnot, now can we actually separate out these subroutines post hoc and then try to use them to train another model later on that is going to be, uh, that can use this subroutine and thereby benefit a lot in terms of better compression or better prediction. That's a question now. Some people try to do it by explicitly encoding this kind of modular architecture like the Jacob Andreas and then others and Brendan Lake and so on have been doing. Some other people have been essentially you know, trying to prune a lot of the ways. And then what happens is that if you prune them carefully, then you, you get kind of the modu modular structure kind of emerges. So that's another way. And there are people, of course, uh, just think that it, that just doesn't matter. You know? mm. <laughs> we just want to make a, like a large black box, right? So mm. yes, I think that it's, it's, up, it's up to what people want and also what the problem actually calls for. Yeah. Mm. Hmm, okay. Um, Kyuan Kim asks, thanks for the awesome talk. Is there any way to automatically find F oh, that is helpful to reduce MDL? I guess this is also related rather than examining yes. whether F is helpful or not. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Do you want to say something more or is, are you done? <laughs> no, I think that, yes, I think that I already uh, answered this question. Yes. Okay. Um, Shin Yu, uh, who is one of our faculty members in software engineering, has a comment and a question. I would like to point out that normal compression algorithms we use have been shown to be a good approximation of homograph complexity, see normalized compression yeah. distance. Using this, you can measure distances between anything. See this paper. Now a question, your work uh -huh. you 
RDA to evaluate features. Is there any work that tries to use compression distance to compare different models? Mm. Yeah, so the, in fact, the, the paper the, that we, uh, the algorithm that we use, the online coding algorithm from by the Blair and Olivier, that is actually kind of one of those papers where at the end of the day, uh, one of the key problem in you know, statistical learning theory is to figure out the generalization bound. Right? So you know, I think given, the, given some data set, okay, find a number of the training examples that we have access to and some model. Now, what is the generalization error that we are going, we can guarantee to be, let's say, lower than or upper than, uh, uh, higher than. So to do that, people have come up with the various schemes in order to estimate that one from a various perspective. Uh, there is, in particular, in neural net, of course, like the Peck Bayesian, let's say, approach has been very successful. And then for that, like the uh, Dan Roy at University of Toronto has been pushing on that direction over and over. Now, of course, the, there are many different approaches. And then one of the other approaches using this kind of variational based approach, and then Blair and Olivier use the online coding and then this compressibility as a proxy to measuring the generalization error. And then that actually allow, allow them to show that the, uh, you can actually get the ordering of the different models in terms of the generalization. And then this online coding turned out to be so much better than the existing, let's say, variational, uh, let's say, base bounds and whatnot. So the answer is yes, yes. So this Blier and Olivier, the, the paper is precisely one of those papers. Great, thank you. I think we would we I, I will let you move on to the next topic because I think you know we're all interested in few shot learning and prompt engineering as well. Uh, but I do want to ask if you want to say if, if only if you want to say um, something how this uh -huh. relates to explainability and fairness. Mm -hmm. um, if you have anything mm -hmm. to say, please do. Otherwise, you can go on. Yeah. So the explainability that that's really interesting in a sense that the. So one way to think about the explainability or the interpretability in my perspective is that it is a controllability. So if I could actually, so what does it mean for me to be able to explain or interpret what is going on in this kind of black box model? And I think uh, in, in my view, that actually means that the, I can tell others or the, I can make this black box model to behave in a way that I want it to by changing some of the internal mechanisms or the, some of the input variables. Because you know, the, if I could do that, that probably means that the, I know what happens inside. And then, you know, the, uh, then you know, the, what, what does it mean? How do we measure this kind of controllability is in fact uh, to see how the predict, prediction changes and then how the prediction changes actually does relate directly to you know, the, how well this model is going to generalize to a new example and whatnot that is the kind of a way of compression. So in that sense, at the end of the day, surprise, uh, not unsurprisingly, all these, let's say, generalization bounds or the learning theory actually do give us some of the tools that allow us to measure the controllability of some algorithm that we can come up with for any of the black box algorithms. And I think that this is a one thing that needs to be done in order for us to even tell whether some of the explainability algorithms or the interpretability algorithms are indeed able to explain or interpret what is going on inside the black box. Because even if, if when, you know, when we get the explain, explanation of how this model arrived at this kind of prediction, how can we actually check that it's the right explanation? I think the only way we can do is that based on the explanation, we should be able to intervene and control so that the, we know we can change the sum, let's say input variables or the mechanism so that so as to change the behavior in a way that we we want it to. Only when that happens, I think the explainability or the interpretability is going to be kind of trustworthy themselves. So that, that that's kind of my view, but it's a bit too far in a sense that they, will we ever even be able to do that? I don't know, it's a bit difficult to tell. Yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, so then let me see, um, I guess I can go, try the next one really, really quickly. So uh, let me just open it here. Um, this the, uh, let me see, oh yeah, I need to share this. There you go. Ah, oh, there you go, yes. So this is the work that we are going to present at this upcoming NeurIPS. And then it's been done with the same people because this was kind of, let's say, the follow-up to what we are doing. So the, re the whole reason 
why we started to working on RDA was to know, you know, the what it means for the this kind of algorithms or the subroutines to exhibit some kind of properties. And then one of the natural questions that we had back then uh, was whether these large scale language models are really, really a future learner as the OpenAI people actually talked about. It's quite understandably a future learner in the sense that the you give some input, it's going to give me some output. And then as long as I can actually make this model to give me the desired answer, then that becomes a future learner. But then the question is, how difficult is it for us to be able to figure out how to make these models give me the answer that we want it to give, right? So, and it, it actually does connect to a bit of a controllability angle and so on. So we tried to use the RDA type of analysis, although it turned out that this, pro uh, this problem was so ill-posed, we didn't even have to go into the RDA and then we just stick, stuck to the cross-validation. But the, I'll go through it really quickly. But the important thing is that we need to start by defining what we mean by future learning, because it turned out that everyone has their own version of future learning in their mind. So usually when we think about future learning, our thought is that there is a future learner F that is parametrized with phi that's going to be a set of hyperparameters of the future learner, so meta learning parameters. And then this future learner is going to take as the input a small number of examples, a few examples, that's why it's called future learning. And then output is going to be a model, right? So given this new, small number of examples, what is a model that's going to solve the next new example very, very well? And then the model can often be, you know, like the, uh, characterized as a set of parameters on its own. And then let's call it a G, right? So we're going to, out, uh, we're going to have a future learner that's going to offer a parameter configuration of this learner, I right? say learned model, G. So it can really be written in just one, one formula, right? So it's going to be G subscript F phi of X1 to Xn, few examples of X prime. So this is future learning. What it actually says is that the, there are two different types of parameters. One is the parameters that the future learner outputs, and then the other is a set of parameters that are used by future learner to characterize this future learner. And then what that says is that the, we have to be able to figure out not only the, what's going to be output by the future learner, but the future learner itself. Because future learner is not given. No one gives us the future learner. So often what we think about is that, okay, we need to somehow have a training task in order to infer or estimate the future learner's parameter fee. And then that's why in the, so for instance, prototypical network from Snell in 2017, they created so-called prototypical network that's going to look at many of the training sets and then trying to learn this so-called embedder. And then what this embedder does, this is a future learner, is going to just output the prototype vectors to which a new example is going to be compared. And the closest prototype vectors class is going to the class of this new example. Similarly, with the model agnostic meta learning or MAMO, the same thing. We have a bunch of training tasks, and this MAMO is going to give us an initialization that's going to be used by SGD, but SGD is just recurrent neural network. In some, uh, it is, so you can imagine this as that the MAMO is outputting the parameter of this recurrent neural net that's going to get us the parameters. To get estimate the parameters of this recurrent neural network, we need to have a training task. In other words, it's nothing different from supervised learning. Fuchsia learning is supervised learning, except that the each and every example tends to be super complicated. It's a set of another, uh, other examples. So, but still all the same thing. We have a training set of Fuchsia training sets. We need to have a validation set of Fuchsia validation sets. We need to have a test set of Fuchsia test sets so that we can estimate the parameters of this Fuchsia learner and then we can choose the right hyperparameters to use to choose this right future learner's parameters. And then to check whether this learned future learner is going to work well in the future. So that's where we're going to use the test set. So it's really just nothing, nothing but a regression model, the future learner that we are learning. 
And then you have the everything stays same. We train, we do the model selection using the validation, and we report the generalization error using the testing. But I'm going to skip a bit. I'm going to skip a bit. And then I'm going to read the, some part of the excerpt from the abstract of the language models of future learners by Brown and all. So from OpenAI, that was uh, awarded the best paper award in New 2020 last year. So they wrote, we show that scaling of language models greatly improves test agnostic future performance. GPT-3 is applied without any gradient updates or fine tuning with tasks and future demonstrations specified purely via text interaction with the model. This was like the one of the most exciting abstract I've ever read so far. Now I got really excited. I'm already everyone else apparently so, right? And then how they actually described the future learning in language model was to come up with a way to essentially talk to the language model so that this language model is going to figure out how to answer a new question based on this instruction that we have talked to this language model. Fascinating, right? So we have few examples, let's say and many examples, and then we have a new example for which we don't know the answer. And then we are going to look at these examples and somehow come up with the instruction, natural language instruction that we're going to give to GPT-3 so that GPT-3 can answer this new question. This is actually pretty nice. This is, I mean, this is in some sense exactly what the AI is supposed to be, right? So we just talk to AI agent and ask the AI to do something for us and then it's going to do it. This is like the dream of AI. But then you really, uh, if, so I mean, the open AI's papers are like that, right? So somehow, you know, they, they have a way to make a 70 page long paper out of the, let's say two line idea, but somehow you know, it is 70 page long. So people get lazy, I get lazy. I, kind of let's say postpone reading it carefully and then I kind of push it to my students and then hope that they're going to read it carefully and then tell me only the gist. Uh, they never do, right? They never do as well. So that's an issue. But anyway, so I read it. Uh, I read it at some point and I realized that the, there are so many hyperparameters. There are so many hyperparameters. In fact, there are exponentially uh, many hyperparameters in a sense that the, uh, from which you need to choose in a sense that you got to come up with a way to describe a task you need to decide how to present examples. You need to decide what is the target token set from which you are going to let the GPT-3 choose the answer from. Uh, you need to uh, even decide the number of training examples present. And then there are a few more. If you go to the appendix G of the OpenAI paper, uh, the GPT-3 paper, it's pretty ridiculous, you know, the, uh, the space of the hyperparameters that you need to choose from. But it's still different from the conventional notion of future learning that we just talked about is that the they never had any training validation fuchsia tests. So how did they choose these hyperparameters, right? And what they claimed was that essentially it's all just text interaction. Uh, their claim was that they would, we just talk to GPT-3 as if we just talk to anybody else, right? But really, what should we tell? What do I need to tell GPT-3 so that it can solve a new problem? So you know, we decided to look into how people actually should chose those prompts. Now there are, there are two possibilities. One is that the GPT-3 is like truly a language, let's say perfect language understanding machine, just like us. Well, not even us, right? So the better than us, so that we can literally say anything reasonable and it's going to answer it in a way that we want it to. Or the other is that the, you have to know how to talk to it very, very carefully. So we, we just started to ask around. So how did they choose prompts? Our New Rips 2020 best paper, Brown et al., in fact, says very, say very uh, clearly that they, they experiment with a few values of K, where the K is the number of examples to present on the development set, and then run the best value. Then you start wondering, okay, what is that development set they have? And then you read the follow-up paper, Tam and Menon et al., from this year, where they say they assume access to a full development set to choose the best masking ratio and checkpoint model. Mm, okay, so the development set is still there. And then you look at the uh, red for the <coughs> Kim et al, uh, 2021, which is the uh, clip paper. They say that they repeatedly query performance on full validation sets to guide the development. Mm, the validation set, development set, validation set, all the same thing. And then you look at the actual uh, notebook, they also look at the training set as well, but that aside. And 
Chin and Eisner 2021, which was a best short paper at NACO 2021 this earlier this year for gradient training, we test with the model that performs best on the dev set. And then you, know, you realize that these the development sets are a labeled training examples in some sense. They labeled examples that are quite substantial, substantial in their cardinality. And then we just continued because you know, okay, so it's impossible that every paper was using this large development set and then saying that they were solving the problem of fusion learning. And then we found two other outstanding papers from the NACO earlier this year. Shik and Shu uh, said that they, they assume no access to a large development set. Okay, that's a good start. However, their choice of hyperparameters was based on choices made in previous work and practical considerations. And then what, what are these previous work? These are these papers are the previous studies that they have taken the hyperparameters from, and they were using all those full development sets. Le, Le Chau and Rush 2021 also said that they use a subset of prompts or the hyperparameters from the Shrik and Schutz 2020B, which is the paper above, uh, which were using the hyperparameters from these earlier papers that were looking at all these large development sets. So what that means is that the, uh, there, it was a bit of a crippled, just, uh, I don't know, what would be the opposite of the fuchsia learning is that the large shot learning or whatnot, in a sense that their learner was not looking only at a few training examples, but also at a large number of validation examples in order to come up with a solution. So what that means is that the uh, we, we, so people who are using GPT-3 uh, with the wonders were doing the hyperparameter search for the machines. And then this is a kind of a, the point at which you realize that the, is it really that the machine learning or the AI is serving us or is it possible that we are actually serving AI so that it can actually understand what we want to say. And then, you know, the, this, the direction becomes a bit fuzzier there. But then, but still, I, I gotta say, it's a very fascinating and it actually does work well. And then we knew that it was working well. So in 2014, when I was in Montreal, we had the very kind of, let's say initial a neural machine translation system based on attention. And then we had a small demo within the lab that we were using to just, you know, the play around with it. And then one thing that we noticed back, th uh, back then was that the, if I give us the input, a English sentence where I mask out one word and then give it some unknown tokens. So the sort in, it to token, and then if I block this translation system to not output this unknown token, then it's going to try its best to fill up, fill in the missing information. So I made up an example and they worked it like immediately. The example was exactly the one that you see here. We were working on English French because I was in Montreal, of course. Source was unknown. Korea is a friend of the United States. And then I let my translation system translate it to French. And it was like the uh, South Korea is a uh, friend of the United States. And then I replaced the friend with the enemy in the next example, and it actually translated into North Korea is an enemy of the United States automatically. So it did have the common sense already embedded, and it was able to uh, work as if it is an information retrieval system, question answering system, or knowledge uh, uh, extraction system or whatnot. So it's very, very, it was very exciting. So it's, uh, you know, it has a huge potential. But still, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we're doing science, so we can't really just uh, work out of the excitement only. So we decided, okay, let's see you know, if we can really make GPT-3 work with only a few examples, like the only few examples. Uh, and then you know, we are going to say, okay, we're going to choose a prompt space on only a few examples. Can we actually do that without having a large held outset? So what we need is a hyperparameter selector, and then we have a fuchsia learner, and then we have a predictor. So the hyperparameter selector is going to look at a few examples and I'll put the hyperparameter for the training of fuchsia learner. And fuchsia learner takes as the input, not only the fuchsia, a few examples, but also the hyperparameter selected by the hyperparameter selector. And it's going to output the actual parameter of the predictor, where predictor is going to make a prediction on the new example based on these parameters that were output by the fuchsia learner. And then we're going to look at the average test accuracy. Because we want to do the true fuchsia learning, we're not going to assume, uh, so this hyperparameter selector can also have access to at most a few examples that the fuchsia learner can look at. This is very different from all those studies that we talked about where they had an access to a very large D prime that is in fact a set of the IID uh, samples where this D, the distribution, 
is same as the distribution from which the few training examples were estimated. What that means is that the accuracies they were reporting were heavily overestimated. So we tried some of these traditional approaches like the k-fold cross-validation, or we used the minimum description length as well because you know, that's what we were very into by then. And then we tested a few other metrics that were reasonably usable when we have, let's say, four to five examples only. So if you have, let's say, millions of examples, there are so many different things that we can do. But if you have, let's say, four to five examples, there aren't too many we can actually do. There's almost nothing we can do, in fact. And to make it worse, if you think about the space of the prompt, which is the, just a natural language, is a combinatorial space. And then it is indeed exponential with respect to the length of the prompt that you're going to use to give to the uh, GPT-3. Obviously, it's not going to be too long, 20, 30, 40, or, or up to, let's say, a few hundreds. But then the size of the vocabulary is like 25,000 or 30,000. 30,000 to the power of 30 is actually quite, quite large. It's almost like the number of the uh, atoms in the universe kind of thing. So it's pretty clear that we can't choose the best prompt out of it using five examples. That's just impossible. It doesn't make any sense, right? So, and then you have to, we can't really do the search over this kind of space. So we relied on a set of predefined prompts. So we are still, still overestimating the accuracies in this case, but we are trying to measure something more realistic. So we tried it. And then you had to, there were a few, three questions we wanted to answer. One is that, can we actually find the best prompt that we could find using a very large validation set using only a few examples? And the second thing is that, the, can we actually do better than just choosing a random prompt? What is the chance that we can do better than just choosing a random manually curated prompt? And then the third one is that, the, what is the gap in the accuracy between the best prompt and this uh, true fuchsia, let's say, selected prompts. So we ran experiments on a pretty standard approach. I mean, at the back then, there wasn't even a standard because everyone was using a large development set. So we had to come up with the experimental setup where we don't rely on the large development set, unfortunately. Um, so I'll just give you the answer. The first one, can we identify the best prompt at least using some of them? Not really, less than 30% of chance to recover the best prompt among the curated set of prompts that we have. And then interestingly so, although the accuracy on general is higher with a large language model, but it becomes even actually more difficult to identify the best prompts when the language model is larger. And we tried the various number of the training examples, this few in the few shot, between let's say five and 40, but it didn't really change. Having, let's say, eight times more data didn't really help. So the more important, uh, more interesting question, can we actually do better than a randomly selected prompt? And then what we want to know is not just you know, whether the average accuracy we can get from random, randomly selected prompts is better than or worse than the best selected prompts using this true fuchsia criterion, but more like how often do we actually do worse than randomly selected prompt because that's the that's the question, right? So if it's going to be a few shot, few shot learning that's going to be used in production, then what we need to know is that the how often it's going to fail. It turned out that it actually fails quite a lot. Like sixty percent of time, the accuracy is going to be lower than the average accuracy we'll get from the randomly selected prompt. And then that was not a really good sign. That the it just meant that the we could very well just randomly select the prompts. And then you know, the, we will say it's not going to be that worse in terms of how often it fails. And it wasn't just on the one particular data set. We tried on the three different data sets as well. And then the observations were effectively the same. About 60% of time, we were getting an accuracy using the best prompt selected from the one of the criteria that we have tested uh, to drop, let's say, below what the random prompts could have done. Yeah, that was not that great. So, but it just makes sense. In a sense, it just says that the, we must have a way to choose a prompt a priori with some other information. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, another paper that was probably submitted for ACL. It's anonymous, so I don't know who wrote it. They actually showed that the, if you, they came up with a new, another criterion that, uh, that they say is much better then let's say cross-validation and whatnot. Unfortunately, they did not compare against the cross-validation or uh, let's say MDL on the same setup that they used. And then that's actually pretty critical because the 
we are looking at an extremely high variance estimate of the generalization error because we're using a very small number of examples. And then when the variance is that large, the problem setup is going to matter a lot in how the different prompts are ordered, how the different algorithms are ordered, and so on. So unfortunately, they didn't actually test it against the other more reasonable criteria beyond the randomly selected ones. But yes, so I need to actually add one more sentence. But I read this paper like two hours ago, so I, could, I didn't have any time. Is that the, either we must have some more information to choose a better prompt, or we should have a much better criterion that I don't think can be done, by the way, it's impossible. There are only five examples. How can we actually choose one, right? Or you know, there has to be something done more than simply saying that, okay, let's choose a prompt here. And then, you know, we actually do lose quite a bit in the accuracy as well. So we can do, you know, as well as the randomly selected prompts, but compared to the best selected prompts using a full validation set, the gap is quite large. The gap differs from one data set to another, but there is always a gap. And then the gap does not get smaller as the language model gets larger. When the language model is large, large, the accuracy tends to be higher. So that's a good thing. So you know it is not all bad, but that's a good thing. However, within that accuracy range that you can get with a large language model, the selecting a best way to prompt the language model given only a small number of examples doesn't exist. It's impossible, essentially. And then it turned out that it's not only about the prompt engineering. If you want to fine tune the entire model using some kind of gradient descent based optimization, you end up with the tons of hyperparameters. And then every time you add one hyperparameter, the space exponentially grows. That's the curse of dimensionality. And then what we noticed was that the, we can't really get those best reported results from the existing literatures if we really use only this small number of examples for the hyperparameter tuning. So we, we really need some more extra information than five examples. It's not that surprising if you think about it. If I have five examples, how am I supposed to find the best, let's say, configuration out of 10 to the power of 20 possible options? I mean, we can't do that. This just the math doesn't work out, right? So combinatorial doesn't work out. And then what also this tells us that the, the We've been actually, during the past, let's say, two years, we actually reported a lot of optimistic accuracies that were overestimating what this model can really, really do, which is fine as long as we know, but, you know, until, up until this paper or up until, the, up until this paper is written, it was just an urban legend that we were overestimating these accuracies, but it turned out that we were indeed doing so. We could actually reproduce how much we are overestimating for various data sets directly. So what is uh, so one somber kind of a say couple of somber real, realizations is that the future learning is difficult, and then yet yeah, it's almost ridiculous that you know we had to write this paper and this spent a lot of time writing this paper, and then the conclusion is that the future learning is difficult because there are only few examples, right? I mean it has to be difficult, uh, and then yet yeah, in particular what we identify was that the, it's not only about learning in future learning that is difficult, but Identifying the good hyperparameters for future learning is very difficult because we only have a few examples. So we often need something extra in order to find good hyperparameter configurations. And then in the case of the meta learning or transfer learning, we often rely on the other similar tasks. Or, you know, in some kind of let's say probabilistic approach, I do believe that we can probably approach it from the uh, inference and then trying to consider many good prompts and then be able to pull from the other, let's say, all layer tasks as well, except that the inference, inference over the natural language space or the combinatorial hidden variable is probably even more difficult than fusion learning. So it's, it's really a difficult problem. It's, it's still difficult even with GPT-3, maybe GPT-4 next year, five, six, it's going to be difficult because the setup is difficult. However, you know, the, uh, since I really am running finally out of time, <laughs> for sure, okay, but it's still extremely exciting, extremely exciting. Assuming that the, we are ready to spend quite some efforts and time and also uh, give up on writing a paper for every uh, conference deadline, and you know, they set up everything really, really carefully and do science carefully, then you know, the, under that assumption, it's still extremely exciting because this actually tells us that the there are yet another alternative to 
let's say, combine so-called, let's say, neural learning and then symbolic learning or the symbolic, let's say, inference. So often when you think about this kind of neural symbolic systems that a lot of people talk about that I have absolutely no idea what they are talking about because you know, those systems, I, I can't see them. I don't know what they are. But anyway, often what they think is to replace some of the parts of this black box neural network or the machine learning system with much more transparent uh, symbolic, let's say, operations. Kind of makes sense. But then you, know, the, you start wondering whether that is the only way forward. And then I do believe that, that this kind of learn, uh, learning to solve a problem by make, having a conversation with a language model tells us that the, perhaps it should be the other way around. We make the execution engine to be black box as usual. However, we interact with this black box, let's say neural engine via symbolic instruction. And in this particular case, it was natural language. It's very exciting. And then if we start looking at the things from this angle, that is that we have a computer, there is a neural language model, there is a neural execution engine, and then we are using some kind of symbolic instruction to make it execute some program, then suddenly we can start uh, interfacing between the existing research scientific community on doing program induction as well as program synthesis. And then trying to see if we can use some of the ideas from there in order to learn to use or to use these language mod neural black box language models better. Now, this will somehow have to be done in order for this paper to withstand the test of time, which uh, according to the NeurIP's best paper committee, uh, according to them that this paper is going to do, but we'll see if that's going to be the case. But yeah, it's very exciting and then this was going to be the, the latter third of my talk, and that does conclude my talk today, yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, language models are not Fuchat learners. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess so, yeah, not yet. I mean, it's getting there, getting there, but not really so, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that title was pretty ambitious. All right, so thank you so much. And I know it's, um, I mean, it's it's lunchtime here, but it's for you, it's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> All right, so let's let's have some questions. If you have a question, you can just unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> I can ask a question. So. I wonder, this is a kind of a random question. Would people know how to do prompt engineering? Can we do like human in the loop kind of a thing? I, which maybe is what you mean by symbolic inst uh, instruction. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but I think the, that question probably can be answered by Minsoc much better. <laughs> HCIPH. Minsoc is here. Yes. Oh yeah, Minsoc <laughs> yeah. is here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So he can answer this question definitely. And then, yeah, so I mean, the, uh, having people, I mean, the people turned out to be much better than cross-validation to figure out what is the kind of reasonable prompts to use. So that's for sure. Uh, but then you know, the, there, there's always a question of, you know, the, so, you know, the, we are really serving GPT-3, not GPT-3 is serving us kind of question. <laughs> yeah, so, well, yeah. yeah, it's a difficult question. Right. I mean, but some people do look at AI as a means to understand our Mm -hmm. that's, true. Yeah, that's true that's true that's true yes but do you have a like that little bit of information that you gave that humans do better is is that in the paper mm. no no i mean the, we couldn't actually uh do that uh that, do that kind of experiments ourselves mm -hmm. but the one thing for sure is that the so we we looked at the essentially the perplexity of these prompts. So how likely they are under the language model itself. And then you know, the, uh, whether you know, the, these language models, uh, so the, whether the good prompts are the highly li more likely under these language models, that there was no such, let's say, correlation. What I think that actually means that the, uh, these language models are working better with the prompts that are not necessarily like the good language to start with. But then you know, the question is, how, how did people actually come up with them? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but people somehow came up with them in this combinatorial space. And there are three possibilities I can imagine. One is that the people are just you know, the amazing. That's one possibility. Second possibility is that GPT-3 is amazing. However, the, it's, 
GPT-3 is quite sensitive to some small perturbations. So that means that it's not as amazing as how awesome people are, are it's, it's, it seems like. Or the third possibility is that the some people uh, people just know how to exploit these uh, systems pretty well. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, that that's that's what uh, what we that's the kind of guess in the idea how people are coming up with, and uh, I think that how the people can actually know how to work with the GPT three. Although you know, not everyone, not everyone. I couldn't actually come up with a good prompt ever myself. <laughs> mm. Could it be? Uh, just another random thought. Could it be that these benchmark tasks are not the most, Yeah. you know, I mean, because if you look at, you know, entailment, I mean, it's not something that we as humans do every day or right. like we do it, but they, uh-huh. the, the benchmark data itself becomes so convoluted that, you know, yeah, maybe, def- definitely. yeah, I mean, maybe GPT yeah, is really good. Yeah. It's just like these tasks are are weird. <laughs> oh, I I totally agree with you in the sense that because most of these tasks were not designed to work with the kind of let's say uh, work in a way uh, with, to be presented in natural language. Mm-hmm. So they you know people are essentially just kind of let's say you know like they artificially put them into a format that looks like natural language. But then, yeah, the, in that way, uh, in in that process, there are a lot of weird artifacts that are being added as well. So, perhaps you know, it's a good time to think about what would be the way to build a data set from scratch that does reflect this uh, nature of being uh, presenting all these examples in natural language. I think that that's actually a, going to be an interesting direction. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I mean, in the end, you know. The point of natural language is to communicate. And I think these right. benchmark tasks are not really designed for, you know, who, no, no, whoever no, no, communicates no. best does best on these tasks kind of a thing. So, yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yes. <laughs> so maybe that should be clue 2.0. Oh, maybe. <laughs> 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 right, clue 2.0. All right, so I'm just going to assume I'll, I'll give 30 seconds to anyone who wants to ask a question. Including Minsok. <laughs> yeah, well, Minsok should answer the question. So. <laughs> okay. It was great actually uh, giving a talk at Computer Science KAIST. And yeah, the, thanks for the uh, invite. And yeah, I hope to stop by at some point in person. Yeah. Yes, please do. We all we would always welcome you, and um, thank you for staying up late for giving this wonderful talk. And it was a long talk, but it was every bit was very very interesting. So, uh, good night to you, you and um, have a nice day. Yes. All right. Bye.